is 16 minutes after 9 o'clock, and joining us in studio this morning, state representative and candidate for governor. We have Rebecca Dow joining us in studio this morning. Good morning. Thanks. It's great to be back. It's great to have you back again. How's life been treating you since last time I saw you? Man, I tell you, New Mexico is full of potential. Yeah. I'm meeting the most amazing people across the state who have solutions to all of our problems, who are innovators, who are entrepreneurs, and we just need government out of the way. It's super exciting. Yeah, I would imagine. That's something uh, it, it, like, yeah, I mean, we've got a crazy time in the world with everything going on and everything, but but at the same time, I feel like it is a, a time of opportunity for for this state. You well, know, it can't get worse. You know, yes, you're Highest right. Highest unemployment, last in nearly everything. You know, but okay. I think with the right leadership, we could, uh, you know, you know, we have so many resources, so many great things that we don't tap into or utilize or 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 promote. Well, yeah. In fact, we go the opposite direction and just suppress people who are trying to create prosperity for our state. And that's got to end. That's just bad government. Yeah. And I just think like if you look at the time we live in, if we play our cards right, we're set up to make New Mexico like a linchpin in this this in the economy of this country for the I mean, just the technology to the oil and gas. Absolutely. But like Los Alamos and what we have there. There's so many resources and things that I don't think we uh, highlight or exploit enough to uh, to make better for this state. And, and you said play your cards right. Yeah. Uh, the, all the cards are pointing in our favor. The yeah. wind's behind the sail for conservative candidates. And for the first time probably in a long time, what I feel in my gut is that Republicans who choose to vote in a mid-year primary election are choosing the next governor of New Mexico. There's no reason to settle. Yeah. We can choose the right governor. And I believe that I'm that candidate with experience, 22 years serving my community. Mm -hmm. I'm a job creator. My husband and I have a business. I've invested in charitable work in my community that has brought families out of government dependency into self-sufficiency. We need to take that to a statewide level. And of course, I'm the only candidate with legislative experience. I'm ready to govern on day one. And there is no time to spare. We have to have a course correction for this state and a a foundation of conservative principles Mm -hmm. that will push us towards prosperity. How much of it, you know, because as a state representative, you you see what goes on in the roundhouse. You're there making those decisions, uh, fighting the decisions that are made and and things like that. How much um, impact does that governor have on decisions coming out of the round? I mean, obviously the, you know, the legislature, they do their thing, budgets. I mean, you see that, you know, even in this governor, re-vetoing things and not agreeing with a legislative body that's pretty much on her side. Um, how much change and how much, like, as a, a conservative governor, can you get in there and force the state assembly to get back to the middle, at least? I mean, I'm, it, a lot of that's voting and people vote in who they want, but at the same time, there's so much bias or partisan politics coming out of there. As a governor, can you get in there and 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 I'm not say change that per se because you can't. That's you know that's people vote, but I mean almost force them to at least say, hey, play in the middle. Let's play nice. Let's. I mean, how much role does a governor have there in influencing there? Well, I'm just curious. You know, I know we see stuff you know on the news and what what uh, governors do, but how much of that's got teeth? How much of that actually? has any impact on what the state legislature does. Well, and it's interesting because I get asked that all the time. What can one person do? Yeah. What can one governor do? What has Michelle Lujan Grisham done to your life, mm-hmm. to your children, in your home, to your health and a- and your um, access to health care, mm-hmm. quali- quality affordable health care? What has she done to our children's education? What has she done to 47% of small businesses? That is one person through executive order. She has got to go. Getting her out would be a huge accomplishment sure. and the first accomplishment that needs to happen. And, you know, my district is 34 percent republican i just won my third term by 57 points that's with the libertarian yeah and that is with every special interest group planned parenthood the unions george soros michael bloomberg the speaker of the house took a personal interest in my race and we won by our biggest margin new mexicans are ready for change and through the gerrymandering process and just the special interest money that comes into these races the people who are elected the majority of them do not represent the everyday new mexican and that is why this gerrymandering was so radical but what can the governor do? Mm-hmm. Executive orders. She is using emergency health orders to micromanage our daily lives. Still, by it the way. has got to end. <laughs> yeah. What has? She, what can she do? So on day one, we end those emergency health orders. If it's an executive order, 
If it's in rules and regulations, or it's something that's established by boards and commissions, we can reverse it. And I disagree with my legislative body that continues to delegate their duties. We are the lawmakers Mm -hmm. to unelected faceless bureaucrats in appointed positions. It is our job to set the rules. I believe we should do more on setting rules and regs. Poor businesses in this state, they experience whiplash. Every time we go into session, they have no idea what we're going to throw at them. And then in in between legislative sessions, there's hundreds of days for rules and regs to be written and imposed on others. And so we've got to establish common sense governance. So in addition to ending the emergency health orders, Mm -hmm. I want to reduce the regulatory environment for our businesses. Let's start with a third. But just appointing cabinet secretaries that are pro-New Mexico, not beholden to some national special interest group. Sure. That understand who we are as as part of a constitutional republic, Mm -hmm. our individual state rights, and being a Western state, a land use state. We've got to have a governor who understands that water use, extracted minerals, oil and gas, mm-hmm. land and vegetation management, all of those things. And we can all work together to make sure that happens. Even, that is bipartisan. Yeah. The, the, uh, even the your environmentalists and your drill, baby, drill people, you know what I mean? There's still, uh, I think, medium gr- middle ground there that we can work with. And I think that's where a governor or a elected official can come in and, and be that mediator to say, look, we got to do this. I understand what you're trying to achieve here, but and, and for folks that don't know, when we talk about oil and gas, there, yes, there's regulations imposed on them, but they live and breathe and work and and play in the same places that they that you do. They do too. That's so right. They, they they go above and beyond on, on making sure that what they do is safe and clean and and things like that. Much more so than when you pull oil out of, say, Saudi Arabia or Russia or China. Or the 47 new coal mines that are being opened in China. We're yeah. not reducing our use. Yeah. We're just creating a dependency on foreign oil and mm-hmm. gas. So, I mean, in energy. So, the, you know, in this last legislative session, the Republicans in the House, we are outnumbered two to one. But regardless, we introduce bills, open Escalante, keep the San Juan power plant open, add natural gas to our clean fuel portfolio. There are so many solutions. And we've in the governor, you talk about the governor, what the OCD is doing, what the environment department is doing, what this um, uh, the I, I just went blank on the name. There's a board that's making these methane rules. Uh-huh. This is all without statutory authority. They're doing this through rules and regs, and it needs to be reversed. We're going in the wrong direction. Gotcha. Two years ago, America was energy independent. The heroes that work in the oil fields in northeast and in, in northwest New Mexico and south. East New Mexico are able to, we, we should not be having an energy crisis in New Mexico. You, we, we should not be having <laughs> these fuel prices at the pump, energy prices for businesses, yeah. for families, just to heat and cool their homes. Yeah. This should not be happening. We have the Permian and the Delaware Basin. And, and, it's and ridiculous. Just to your point, uh, and, and I was actually talking on Friday with, uh, which I just played this morning here, Congresswoman Yvette Harrell. Yes. And we were talking, and, and just last week there was, uh, Senator Heinrich was putting a thing out saying that Mar- uh, some kind of resolution about getting uh, stop using Russian oil and all this. And I was like, yeah, but you're not telling him where to get it from. I mean, you represent a state that does this. OK, I get stop Russia. Yeah, you should have been just saying that months ago. But but. Why aren't you saying, guess what? We've got you covered here in New Mexico. Let's- End the federal ban yeah. on leases in yeah. New Mexico. That pipeline that was shut down before all this went down, um, yeah, that would be real handy right what now. What good does the it? resolution do? <laughs> yeah. Demand that we pre- resume pr- uh, approved leases yeah. on federal land. He's supposed to represent the state our state. And I, think, and, and, and I think our governor should have come out and said something like, look, you represent us, dude. You know, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, you need to represent us in that conversation and say, hey, we're the ones that can help you, not just call for something like this and then and then well, basically shut your own state out on being part of the solution there. You know, I, it's got to be frustrating for folks. My dad was an oil field worker, so I grew up on the pipeline for most of my early years, mm-hmm. and it's got to be frustrating. I know how hard the work is. You know, I have family that are independent petroleum producers that, you know, my grandpa was a chemical engineer. These are heroes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, everybody wants energy on demand. They all want the byproducts of petroleum products, but they don't want to talk about where it comes from or or reduce their use. Sure. And so it's hypocrisy at its highest level when these elite 
uh, politicians, career politicians, by the way, House of Representatives are volunteers. We are, I am not a career politician. I'm not paid to serve in the House. I do it because I love New Mexico and the people who call it home. But these people who have become millionaires, mm-hmm. like Michelle O'Han Grisham, as a career politician, her net worth grows all the time. And yet they want to spend all the money from your hard work, but not even repair the roads. Right. Or create parity of pay for high demand jobs where, you know, how, how do you get an EMT or a law enforcement officer or even a truck driver or a bus driver or to keep teachers in, in ag and tech, votech positions when they can go work in the oil field for more? So we have to look at this region, sure. which is the only region in this economic development region in the state that has more private jobs than publicly funded jobs. Embrace it, celebrate it, support it, applaud the work of this region. Mm-hmm. And embrace the fact that we are an energy-rich state and we have solutions to New Mexico's energy crisis, the U.S., and we can help solve world problems. Absolutely. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit because this is something, in case people haven't noticed, um, a particular issue that's something conservatives have been talking about for a long time now. And now that it's an election year, you're starting to hear Democrats talk about it, (laughs) is crime. Okay. Um, Our governor's now at least publicly talking about getting tough on crime and all this. This is something I know you and, and many of your Talk constituents is has been screaming from rooftops about this for for for, for years now. Um, yeah, talk a little don't, bit about don't, that. Talk don't about, be fooled by the rhetoric. Yeah, that's Do what not I be fooled. I sat in that session, and they literally introduced a bill, and the tough on crime bills died pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. The, the, the bills that were getting ground and were passing through chambers – Gave victims who are low income at risk would not have to pay penalties or fees. <laughs> so if you're low income, you didn't have to pay your penalties or fees. That's great. So, you know, my colleague, Stephanie Lord, makes an amendment and says, what if it's a violent crime? What if it was a homicide or they raped a child? Yeah. No, the amendment was not accepted. Wow. The second half of the bill said that if they were uh, assigned community service, that these criminals would get uh, a credit at twice prevailing wage. Wow. These are criminal. They care more about criminal rights. You know, I, I, I am glad that good things happen in an election year. Mm-hmm. If you listen to the governor's state of the state, she talked about tax credits. I've been co-sponsoring the bill to end the tax on Social Security income. We made some progress on that. I always sign on to the bill that, you know, others have led the charge long before I was in the House to eliminate the tax on military retirement income. And that made some progress this year. All, everything is compromised. Uh, you know, I was the co-sponsor on a bill for occupational licensure. The governor actually said signed it. It creates, you can move into the state from out of state and we assume that you're qualified. And and the compromise was you get a year to comply with New Mexico uh, licensure in, sort, in order to go to work. Um, but I mean, it, crime is just another example of rhetoric. Sure, It's rhetoric. The We we had a bill it, 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 sitting with Representative Lane on the House floor and listening to qualified immunity go away for our law enforcement officers. And it was so infuriating that if they are accused of violating someone's uh, their um, civil rights, yeah. that that the city and municipality would have to pay up, up to two million dollars in a payment for violating civil rights while the survivors of fallen officers in this state get two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. So this year, you know, we had a Republican bill. It was it was killed, but they rolled it into this, you know, tough on crime package, which wasn't tough on crime. But now survivors are going to get a million dollars. And so the Republicans championed that and a lot of the other things uh, that were kind of, you know, they did a compromise on. There's nothing tough on crime. Criminals are getting more rights and victims are getting no justice. Otherwise, we wouldn't see record homicide rates over and over again. Just for for your opinion, I mean, is it is an overhaul of our court systems and that needs to happen to get this? I mean, I know there's many layers to why they were having these problems, but Mm -hmm. but but. Does it stem from courts and the ability to, to lock these people up and having the, I know, I know that's part of it. They, they don't, they catch and release. We, yeah. you know, they, they don't want to pay for, for housing, I guess, all these folks or something. I don't know, but well, I think there's, there's, there's some solutions, Yeah. but I think the problem comes from the fact that 87% of voters, when it went to the voters on a constitutional amendment voted for bail bond reform Gotcha. and it's just like progressives do. They misrepresented on the ballot what they would intend to do in application of the law. Sure. And so now people say they don't like catch and release, but 87% of New Mexicans voted for that. Well, so it's think, misrepresented. Well, and, we and, have progressive judges, and just what, like we have progressive lawmakers. Yeah. And what you mean by misrepresent is they present the criminal as a victim 
And, and in actuality, that's probably 1% of the criminal. You know what I mean? Like, right. Like uh, they say, well, this person had. And, and yes, we all have hard stories. I understand that. But we seem to have gotten into a society where we're saying, well, because you've had a hard life, your actions are justified now. No. I mean, it's like last night with the Oscars. I mean, yeah, the, you know, we'll, but is anybody saying. Unbelievable. What? Could you imagine if a conservative did that? Yeah, if someone else did that, they would have been in jail. And and that's the double standard. And I think this is kind of what's going on is a criminal double standard here. They're saying. The other problem is, is this governor does not believe in private prisons. Yeah. So as you know, these contracts are renewable every four years. And as the contracts are coming up, they're just quietly not renewing those contracts. And she's released so many criminals. And even violent criminals, they're being released onto the streets. And so our jails are at lower capacity than they've ever been at the same time that our probation and parole, our corrections are understaffed, overworked, lots of overtime. And and we're not able to even monitor people who do have GPS trackers and ankle bracelets on them. I mean, there's a crime just last week. Yeah. And it was, a, you know, one of Stapleton's uh, And you almost, and you almost shake son. your head just like, it's, yeah. it's, it's laughable, it's so ridiculous. Right, but the, the real work is hard, and it's it takes time. We sure. didn't get here overnight, so we've got to have immediate and early interventions. We've got to have treatment programs for folks who have addiction and for behavioral health issues. You know, we've got so many of, uh, of the folks that are on the streets, they were failed by CYFD over and over again as a child. Yeah. And so I, I am I've done emergency placement for CYFD for two decades, and that agency is broken, and they cannot fulfill their mission, which is to protect children who are at risk of abuse and neglect. Those children, which most abuse and neglect happens under the age of six, are exposed to traumatic events over and over again because they are returned to the same broken home over and over again. And so their lives are changed forever. The way their brain develops, the way they perceive the world— And then our teachers are spending 80% of their time with those 20% of the children. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to drop out. They're more likely to have juvenile issues. Then they're juveniles. They break into your garage. They steal your tools. And there is absolutely no consequences. They are taught and trained that crime pays. By the time they're 18, they are very practiced in breaking the law. So CYFD needs reforms. And that's the hard work that takes time that will start changing the systemic problem for the next generation. Sure. And and that, that impacts so many other facets. I and mean, we talk about the PD and education. And, yeah. and we all see those numbers. I would imagine what we're talking about here impacts that side as well, too, because these kids have to be in school. They're somewhere. And so they're, they're creating these problems in the schools as well, too, where you've got to do something with them. I mean, my wife's a teacher, so, you know, I, I kind of see a little bit of what she deals with on some of those things we talk about. And, yeah, it's... You know, you have kids, and at the end of the day, you're, you know, you look from a certain perspective, and you're like, why is this kid in this classroom with these other kids? They should be somewhere else getting specialized attention. And they, I know and we that's right, and they yeah. don't, they don't even have to be in class because yeah. CYFD is no longer considering uh, educational neglect. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that they don't even look at that anymore. And so, you know, somehow these school districts are supposed to chase down these children who are literally. Uh, unschooled. Yeah. And I mean, no one's homeschooling them. They're not at a private school. They're just not in school. And that's also, you know, who's in charge of that? And I imagine three years of COVID probably enhanced that tenfold. Yeah. Uh, but when you talk about education, you know, we, we are, we've tried everything. We did a constitutional amendment under Bill Richardson that uh, centralized the power to a governor appointee, a secretary. We've had a Democrat, Republican, and a Democrat governor, and we're still the worst in the nation. Our educational outcomes are still the worst in the nation. All research shows that parents are the number one indicator of school success. All the studies show that the two things we can do to reform education is reduce the classroom size, which we never take on because that costs money. Right. And uh, school choice. Yeah. You know, parents engaging in their students' education. And school choice is not just for students, especially when you talk about children who need specialized education. Every child needs to be able to have an educational pathway where their individual needs are met especially children with disabilities who learn in different ways, but all children and PED, especially Albuquerque public schools, children who are low income at risk, disproportionately minority are stuck in failing school districts. They have no options. And, and now take the fact that we still paid for this education system, even while children were forced to be at home. Mm -hmm. We were the most locked down for the most amount of time. And, Self-reporting and national studies are showing that our children are behind more than they ever were. 
that they are committing self-harm. They're suicidal. They've uh, There's been higher, our homicide rate among young children doubled. Mm-hmm. Uh, they feel isolated. They're on electronic devices far too long. They're uncertain about their future. They have no hope in their future. And we have got to change that. Public education department is failing New Mexico's children. There's no one who can dispute that. And teachers are stuck in these failing systems. Yeah. Educational innovators are stuck in these failing systems. Dollars following students is the solution. And- you know, and and the, the, that's you know that's the point. And, and giving parents choice, getting them and teachers, involved, and educators. Um, but obviously, you know, as governor here, I'm curious. You know, we talk about the PED, and and a lot of people. Another issue that's been going on. We look at the Florida school board. A lot of uh, who's making the decisions for the kids. Should the power lie in these school boards at the local level, or should they be? You know what the PED is doing right now, and basically micromanaging every school board in the district or in the state right now. Um, no matter what, obviously there's got to be some kind of standardization and things. We can all do that, but but at the end of the day, um, what, do you support? You know, hey, letting the school boards do what's best for their kids in their district, or 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 or, or are you okay with a more PED? Uh, the more local the you can be, the better. Yeah, the more local you can be. The better. It doesn't matter what question you ask me. Smaller government yeah. is better government. To think that a faceless bureaucrat in Santa Fe cares more about the educational outcomes and career opportunities and citizen, future citizenship of the children in this community, mm-hmm. more than your local elected officials, more than the teachers who know them by name, more than their parents, is is just a flawed premise. And you are right about the transparency. So, yes, local governance. My kids grew up in the K-12 system in New Mexico. And Aaron and I were actively engaged in their education. They did homeschool, private school, public school, and dual enrollment based on their needs year by year, what the circumstances are with our family, what sports they were involved in, what uh, extracurricular activities they're involved in. But every child needs to have no closed door. They need to have opportunities. And um, it's our job to partner with parents to make sure we understand their children's potential and that we help them reach that full potential. They graduate and progress each grade to their best of their individual potential. And they graduate with a post high school goal in mind. That doesn't mean college. Um, You know, so, so yes, we elect local school board members and we get to look them in the face. When we see them at church, we look them in the face. When we go into our communities, we see them in a restaurant Mm -hmm. and they partner with people who public education department have given a stamp of approval on their qualifications to be administrators, to be teachers, to be Mm -hmm. principals. And I, you know, I was the co-sponsor of Senate bill 96. It was a couple years ago with, um, you know, as a house sponsor and we passed that bill with no opposition. And the idea is that we follow dollars, children, generate dollars and once they hit the district we don't know where they go but this bill is supposed to create transparency in how the dollars are spent and give us the ability in the future to track whether those dollars had an impact because we cannot keep going back to session year after year and the only solution is money yeah we've invested more and it's more than half of our budget right now with no educational outcomes sure and so we have to track those dollars. And it's kind of like, because this always kind of had an off-putting taste in my mouth, too. It's, it, it, you know, because public schools are like, I hope we got more kids coming into the district because more kids mean we're going to get a bigger check from the state. And, uh, and, and, and to a point, I get that's how it works. I understand it. You got, you got a thousand kids. You're going to need, you know, uh, the financing, the funding to, to, to educate a thousand kids. I, I get that. But it almost, I, I don't like the image like, ooh, you know, with superintendents or whatever looking, it's like, ooh, we got 12,000 more kids this year. That means we're going to get more money. And I'm like, yeah, how about how about the public education department coming in and saying, hey, we'll give you more money yeah. per child. We'll, we will bump up your allocation on every bit of your allocation if you will just extend your school day. Yeah. Or just extend your school year. How about for uh, full day year round school? Well, you know. That should be local decision-making authority. They are literally enticing administrators into forcing that on families and children who don't want it or need it. You know, I say in in my district, there's two people per square mile. And guess what? We like spending time with our kids. These farmers and ranchers, their kids are already getting on the bus before the sun comes up and they don't get home until the sun goes down. They, I think what they're learning on the farm and ranch and when they're sitting in the truck with their dad, having conversations with their family, that's part of... Absolutely. That's yeah. educational. It's part of growing up. Yeah. And, and so you don't, you're not entitled to our kids for a longer day 
and and year round if that's not what the local community wants or needs. So sure. this Senate bill 96 that I was a house co-sponsor on will allow school districts to say, guess what? We're 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 an ag producing community and we're going to use dollars to, you know, enrich our FFA and 4-H programs. These kids are going to learn financial literacy skills, da 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 da, da and we're going to invest this much in it. Fine. That's that's the capacity of your community. It represents your the needs in your community. You're trying to build capacity and and keep New Mexico families fed and American families fed, show us the educational outcome tied to it. Maybe Albuquerque says our kids are low income. They can't focus on math because they didn't have breakfast. We want to give them free, everybody free breakfast. No one opposes that. Mm-hmm. We don't want children hungry where Absolutely. they can't vote. So, so now you gave them free breakfast. Did their math score go up? Who got the free breakfast and did their math score sure. go up? We need to be Was able to track. Was there a result to what we did? Because these are taxpayer dollars. Sure. And we're all in agreement. We need to improve educational outcomes. That's not partisan. Yeah. So let's give local uh, school boards and local districts the authority to create a plan, tell us what the input is, how we're going to measure the outcome, and how much it's going to cost. Yeah. And prove it works. And 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 rely on our partnerships too. I mean, we look like I, I know here in Roswell, the RASD and everything, they partner yeah. hand in hand with Eastern New Mexico University Roswell and some of our business leaders and things like that. And and all that comes from the school board at the local level, talking more about what you were saying earlier about, you know, what, what meets the needs of this community and things like that. And and so they do a great job of fostering at Let's, uh, you know, you're saying, well, let's get out of the way and let that happen as opposed to micromanaging every little thing here. Uh, Correct. And that's kind Correct. of what we're talking and about. And that's that's for the public education department, and we need more options. Absolutely. Um, we're running short on time, but um, I do want to invite folks. We're gonna, You're going to be uh, having a little uh, meet and greet uh, here uh, tonight, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, it's Come a, hungry, by the way. Yes, absolutely, because there's going to be some good food. It's from 537 at Valley Cafe 901 on Brasher. Yes, yeah. uh, over by Church on the Move. It's that's actually right. their 180 building. Uh, they're on Brasher right across uh, from the main church there. Um, come on, you should go there now and have breakfast. They're open until two, but but they have a special food. menu for tonight, and you can come and meet. And uh, if you want to learn more about getting involved with the campaign, you know, sure, all that. Kind we of are stuff. less than seventy days away from the primary election. I want to remind the listeners: I believe the governor of New Mexico is being chosen on June seventh. All data indicates that this governor is in trouble. She's underwater in her rating. There's been a huge double digit swing in yeah. her favorability. Don't settle. I'm here to earn your vote in the primary. I, I am tired of hearing my opponents say it doesn't matter who you pick. Anybody's better than MLG. That is absolutely not true. There is no time for status quo. We have got to turn our state around. Nearly every agency is broke, broken. They're not functioning as they should. Government is here to serve the people. The most powerful person in the state is the governor. And their job is to give the power back to the people. We have got to turn the state around. I think New Mexico, it's our time to thrive. Sure. But it's also our constitutional republic, who we are as individual state rights, the American dream. And I understand the regulatory process as a business owner regulated by nine different state agencies, as a uh, person who has started nonprofits in my community. I get it. I know how hard it is. And I applaud the people who are able to pivot and survive through this disastrous environment. Yes. But we are going to turn the state around. I need your help. I am I'm a name on a ballot. But I am a courageous, proven leader in this state. I care about my community. I care about my district. I care about this state. And I am ready to hit the ground running on day one. I need your vote in the primary. That's the important one because, like That's I right. said, this is uh, – I, I, I do want to – and, again, come out tonight. Valley. What time is uh, everything start at the Valley Cafe? 5.30. 5.30 p.m. And uh, how long are you guys going to be We're going to be there till 7. We'll okay. be there till 7, but so I'll, I want to talk to everyone. Anytime in between, then, come on by. Absolutely. Uh, have some delicious food if you haven't had a chance and sitting down and talk with Rebecca. Get involved. And like you said, where primary is is, is weeks it's away. It's yeah, weeks it's, away now. And here. so if you if you want to volunteer with our team, if I'm your candidate, or if you've got some questions we weren't able to get to or, co- you know, some content we didn't sure. get to on policy-wise, 575-571-1056 is my cell. One, one Facebook, real, Instagram, Twitter. One real quick, um, just because what's... After June's going to happen, it's it's yeah. United Front again, yeah, you know, absolutely. because we have one, one, one candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I would like to say win, lose, or draw. I hope that all of these candidates stay involved with the Republican Party, and and and, and regardless of who's the nomination uh, here in June, because I, I think there's, you know, you and your opponents, they all want good things for New Mexico, and I think at the end of the day, all of you absolutely would do good things for this state. 
I, I Absolutely. Just, I just hope none of you go away. You know before, what I mean? Like, before I, mean, I even turned 18, yeah. I was volunteering for Republican candidates. Yeah. And I was thrilled to vote for Ronald Reagan when I turned 18 for his reelection. Yeah. I have been recruiting candidates and helping them win across this state uh, during my time in the House. I don't walk away. Yeah. Other candidates have. Sure. I just like, I think some of your opponents and yourself include, you all have unique expertise. Correct. And I think all of you in some way, shape, or form could provide good things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like it, it, as governor or as an appointment or something, I hope all of you and yourself included keep leading on New Mexico, whether it's the governor or working with the governor or working, you know what I mean? Well, when I win the primary, I would welcome any of the opponents to, to continue to stay engaged awesome. in the process. Because I think it's going to take every single one of us to it get will. involved on this thing. It and, will. And uh, um, we've, uh, and this, because this is the part, I'm not native to this state. I moved to New Mexico and like, uh, I, well, I, Air Force brought me here in 97. So I've been in New Mexico since 97. But one thing I've noticed here is is this state is 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 been set in its ways for so long. And I go to like Lincoln and I'll read all the history of the Lincoln County War. And if you sit and read all the little things, now you know exactly why New Mexico is the way it is. It's because, time to unite. You know, and I think it's time for that change. And I think and I think um you know, uh, I, I, at this point, I just would love to get us back to the middle where where conservatives have a voice because I almost feel like, to get any value that's a conservative value through New Mexico right now, you either have to kick, scream, fight, or um, you're not getting hurt. You know what I mean? And, or have and, a Democrat governor in election year who's going to lose. Yeah. And so I'm hoping now's the time for that push to at least, if nothing else, get us to middle right. where we can right. have good conversations in our legislature that actually are doing stuff instead of, yourself and a few handful of, of Republicans trying to, to fight off every little thing. And, and if you win half of them, that's a huge day for you. You know yeah. what I mean? We can win. United, yeah. we can win. And, you know, I heard a statistic yesterday that sort of concerned me. This is a, a Republican county. And this region is a Republican region, yet you just had local elections with less than 20% turnout. Yeah. We have got to turn out Republicans in this election. And I've, I've been doing that in my district. And, and independents decline to states, swing, swing voters. And, and I know it, it takes all of us to win and to turn this state around. And I know for a fact our, our last election, you know, even a couple, you know, representative things, um, voter turnout hurt. Uh, and, not, and, and people would have won had... People just come out to vote, right. and, and that didn't happen. So, right. so uh, if nothing else, come out and vote because uh, your vote absolutely counts. Look at our locals, our municipal election here. That that race was separated. You know, mayor racings, fifty votes. Fifty. That's nothing. And some of these city council, you know, half dozen votes sometimes can be the difference in it. And so we have a unique opportunity. This is yeah. it, guys. If we do not take back our state, I'm talking about just. The basic principles that are are ours, given to us by our mm -hmm. Constitution and our Bill of Rights, those are at risk. Yeah. And if we do not take back our state now, I do not know what America looks like in the next generation. Right. And so this is our opportunity. We cannot sit home. I, I never do. I mean, I, I'm out knocking doors. I, I, I knocked doors for one of my opponents in his statewide race. He still lost. But I mean, I, we did our part in my sure. district. But I'm just saying, like, I, I don't like losing. I like winning. And that's why my treasurer became a Senate candidate. She's now a representative in a district that was Democrat for decades. My friend became a House candidate. He's now a representative in a seat that was Democrat. We're winning because we are doing the work and getting out the vote. Nice. One and we're going to take that to the statewide level. Excellent. So come out tonight, learn Thanks. more, talk with uh, Rebecca Dow at Valley Cafe beginning at 530 this evening. Uh, they're on uh, Brasher. Come out and then uh, what's again, give out website and oh, yeah. uh, on, and Facebook, all the ways that people can learn more sure. about Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca for NM dot com is our website. Uh, you can just Google Rebecca on and it comes up, but also Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Please follow our page. Invite your friends to follow our page. My cell phone number is five, seven, five. 571-1056 if you want to volunteer, if you want to give to the campaign, if you need signs and bumper stickers, come out tonight. We will have shirts and bumper stickers. Some of the stuff uh, is in. Signs are in route. Uh, but we, we it's around the corner. It's time to get to work. Yep, it is officially uh, go time. So, go time. Uh, as always, appreciate your visit. Thank you for your service to our state and continued service here. And and uh, always have an open forum here. And uh, 
you know, uh, and as obviously as governor, uh, would love to have you here anytime you're in town and visiting and things like that. So appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Get, make sure you get some good food, but don't eat too much because you're going to be hurting if oh, you go. Oh, this but. has been rough. Uh, the campaign, tra- the hardest part about the campaign, tra- <laughs> people are like, what's the hardest part? It's the attack ads. It's all people like, you know, yelling at you. I'm like, no, it's like it, no routine. <laughs> so you just eat when you eat yeah. what you eat, you know, what you're given. And that's probably the well, hardest part. Well, you do a lot of walking. So that'll, that, so less time well, in the gym in and more theory, time on the streets. So. In theory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. We'll, we'll see you next time. Right. Okay.